Please turn in your Bible. I'm just going to give you somewhere to turn tonight. I almost don't need to. Uh, it's kind of an introductory message. But go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. And we'll be there eventually. As we have uh, announced, this is the first of three messages on the Lord's Supper that we will have for tonight and the next two Wednesday nights. And then the church will partake of the Lord's Supper on May the 12th. And after that, we will get back to our study of Ephesians. You're not going to get a sermon tonight. I, I don't know. Some people say I get preachy no matter what. But I just feel like this is going to be more informational and I, and I really I love inspirational, but I love informational too. I I really do. And and I'll have to say I just really appreciate uh, the teaching of the Lord's Supper in this church. It's it was years ago, but it was the first time I really got teaching in detail on the Lord's Supper. I had been in churches before that, and there was the partaking of the Lord's Supper, and there was the hitting of the highlights of it in that moment. And, and as a as a young Christian, I didn't understand it all. So it was in this church that I really started learning these other details years back. And and I appreciate it so much. And so I'm I'm uh, content and happy to just give information and us talk and share on the Lord's Supper tonight. This is the first of three messages tonight. We're going to share the institution of the Lord's Supper of the Lord's Supper. And then next week, we're going to share the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Not that we're going to take of it. That's the title of the message. I just thought about how that sounds. Next week, the, the title is the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And then on that third week, we're going to share the reason for the Lord's Supper. And we'll get to Matthew 26 later. But for now, just like in Sunday school, as a lot of us know, that first lesson is an introductory lesson to the book. And we're kind of at an introductory lesson to the subject tonight. So so let's introduce it as we consider two things that have been incorporated into the church that uh, are by way of symbolism that we acknowledge and we observe and we partake of. And that's baptism and it's the Lord's Supper. These are not practices that we have just picked and chosen out of several and, and it's an a la carte buffet and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We partake of... We have practice in these two things because of the scriptural teaching in the New Testament and how they are to be incorporated into the church and there are, they are to be observed. These two things out. God planned them and the church is to practice these two precisely. And I tell you, it's good that we do because both of them are a picture of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, what he has stepped in our place to do. And we have a, a visual, if you will, we have something symbolic here and it's so you and I can remember what he has done. You know, we need help as Christians and God knows what help we need and this is something that is done for us to always remember what the Lord has done for mankind to provide salvation, to save us out of the lost estate that we are in. If there are things we think we can't praise the Lord for today, we can praise him every day for that day of salvation where he set us free at the sacrifice of himself. And we're reminded of this by these two practices that we're a part of. They're encouraging and they're an inspiration to God's people. And we're reminded to do it. 
Now, we refer to these two practices as just simply something that's been ordered, something that's been come. Carried out. Of the book of Ephesians. Uh, otherwise. And we have duties. That are commanded. That are given to us. As a moral standard. A way of moral living. But this is a command in another way. For a memorable observation. And you know, and as we get into the Lord's Supper, unfortunately, there is so much confusion in this world. There's a lot of conflict that takes place. I think what comes to some people's mind is an argument before the Lord Jesus Christ and how we're to be reflecting upon him. However, as I say that, we're going to go ahead and address some things Tonight, I, w I would rather just us focus on the broken body of our Lord Jesus and his shed blood, but in a need to be informed and uh, the belief that it's important, we're going to try to help some confusion on the truth of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. The first thing I'd like to say is that there is no saving ability that comes by way of partaking of the Lord's Supper. It's inner faith that saves. Faith in the Lord Jesus alone, in Christ alone, is who saves us from our sins and how we're saved from our sins. There is nothing outwardly which would be religion, not relationship. Nothing religiously that's outwardly can save our soul. It's clearly inwardly by faith. We are in, again, as I say, the book of Ephesians otherwise. And in chapter 2, we came across a verse that says it all. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Baptism, well, we're sticking to the Lord's Supper tonight. The Lord's Supper is a picture of salvation, but it doesn't produce salvation. It, that's true of all ordinances, but the Lord's Supper does not produce salvation whatsoever. It is faith alone in Christ alone, not an outward ordinance. There you know, there are some who follow several outward ordinances. They, there's no scriptural uh, foundation for it. But there's a lot of people who, who do. A lot of groups who do. Up to even seven. And then there's other religious groups. And they follow no outward ordinances at all. But we see clearly in the New Testament instruction that there are no more and no less than two ordinances that we are to partake in, that we are instructed to be a part of. There's a lot of people who would like to make it three. There are a lot of Baptists who would like to make it three. And that third one that people would like to put in there is the... To teach them. They had been talking about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so what a, what a great opportunity to teach the apostles humility. This was a picture of servanthood. It wasn't a picture of salvation. The two ordinances that we observe are a picture of salvation. But this one of servanthood for that moment in time that was a need of the apostles. It doesn't fit as to be one of the ordinances that is to take place. It's in a different category altogether than the Lord's Supper. 
But as we consider and talk about the Lord's Supper for a minute, let's consider the timing of the Lord's Supper, as in the first occasion of the Lord's Supper that we have in the Bible. Let's go ahead and read a little scripture tonight. So in Matthew, where you are in chapter 26, I'm going to start reading in verse 17 down through verse 30. And we'll make a lot of scripture reference. This might be the only scripture we read. It says, now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover. Now, when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve and as they did eat, he said, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He saith unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. This was the evening before our Lord Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross at Calvary. He evening and he had an illustration prepared for them, the bread and the fruit of the vine, and he used it to birth the ordinance of the Lord's supper. of Passover. Passover was a feast that was celebrated annually. Back at the Passover, it was the time of the freeing up, the rescue, the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the hand of Pharaoh, when the plagues just kept on coming upon them and Pharaoh would harden his heart with every decision. And he stayed in Egypt. And that last plague that came was every family. And, and so as the message went out to the children of Israel that were there, though, they were to take a lamb. And a certain lamb of a certain age, and they were to kill that lamb, and they were to take the blood, and they were to put it on the doorpost. Being killed. And just as the scripture says, and as the song says that we sing, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So after that annually was a celebration with a feast of the glory of God and his power and his ability to deliver them and they honored God and they praised God for that and they remembered that every year with the Passover. And now in Jerusalem, and Jesus is 
continuing on in one sense, and he's instituting to the church the Lord's Supper. This is the timing. This is the first occasion of the Lord's Supper as it has been instituted uh, by the Lord into his church. You can read about the Passover, if you want, in Exodus chapter 12 later. But I, there, so this observance went on and there was a recalling and there was a showing of respect and and reverence to God. And so now with what the precious lamb of God, his son was going to do for us, there was the Lord's Supper that was instituted. The blood of the lamb on the doorpost was a type of salvation, if you will. And they were celebrating that the day before the lamb who would shed. All of the people. Time of the institution of the Lord's Supper. But. But the placing of the Lord's Supper, there was a special certain place for the assembly when the people of God gathered. In the upper room in Mark chapter 14, it's referred to as a guest chamber, but it was a place. It wasn't public. It was off to itself. What's important is that it was in Jerusalem. It was. of the Lord's Supper, but as we look into the participating in the Lord's Supper, we find something from the very first time it took place that is to be true to this day. Now, the participating in the Lord's Supper, it involved Jesus and his apostles. This was the first church. If anyone's unaware, the first church was started by Jesus as he walked upon the Sea of Galilee and he called those to follow him. And he gathered his apostles and Jesus and his apostles became and constituted the first church. And they gathered for the Lord's Supper. And no one else was in attendance for this event, except for Jesus and the apostles, this wasn't made to be a public event. It was just. Partake of the Lord's Supper with Jesus and the apostles. In the strictest sense, the Lord's Supper, we would not call it a, a Christian ordinance or a believer's ordinance. It is made up of Christians and believers. But in the strictest sense, the Lord's Supper is a church ordinance. Church as in a local called out assembly of baptized believers. Of the Lord's Supper. In other words, the Lord's Supper is not something that was ever designed in any way for individual participation. It was for the church from the beginning when Jesus instituted it. He designed it from the beginning that the participating in the Lord's Supper would be of those of the same congregation. Now, as we look at the reasoning for the Lord's Supper, the reason for the Lord's Supper, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and his willing sacrifice in our place that he was crucified on the cross and that he suffered and was broken and he bled for you and I. He gave up glory to come down and to make himself a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death in our stead upon our behalf. And so there's the institution of the Lord's Supper. 
But we also have the ingredients of the Lord's Supper that we will share for a minute tonight. And just as we ended the last point on the reason for the Lord's Supper being all about Jesus. Unfortunately, there's a lot of conflict and a lot of things that go on that just cause people in their minds to stray from the heart and the truth and the true remembrance of the Lord's Supper. There's a lot of debate over the ingredients of the Lord's Supper. There's a lot of dismissal of the ingredients of the Lord's Supper. It would blow our minds to see what people will substitute for what we drink and what we eat. Believe what people would do. And they say that it does not matter. But in the midst of all the conflict and all the confusion, we can have confidence from the word of God that we have the instructions precisely that God would have us to walk through to to properly carry out the Lord's Supper. It's just like Noah with the building of the ark and all of the details in the construction that were was given of that ark or or of the of the of the outer courts of the tabernacle and the holy of holies and there was so much detail they were to precisely build it. There was a certain way they were to take it down as they moved from through the wilderness and to put it up again. There was such precise detail that God has given in those things. And he has done none less with the partaking of the supper. And so amidst all the confusion, let's base our information on the Bible. And let us see that there are two elements that, that are used in the Lord's Supper. And that is the bread and that is the fruit of the vine. The bread, it's really easy to believe that it was unleavened bread. Some say it definitely was. We can't put our finger right on that. We can put our finger right on unleavened bread being used in the Passover. You can find that in Exodus chapter 13 and verse. really easily think that it was unleavened bread again. The unleavened really fits with uh, the details of the bread. You know what doesn't fit? That's amazing that some people believe is that they take that bread and it becomes the life of Jesus within them. The bread is only representation of the body of the Lord Jesus. And the breaking of the bread is representation of the bruising, of the suffering, of the brokenness of Jesus' body that he went through when he stood in our place. And he took our place in that suffering on our behalf. So we take of the bread and we remember God coming in the flesh. And we remember Jesus giving his life for us. Jesus is the bread of life. And he was broken by substituting himself in our place. We have the bread. And then we have another element. And it's the fruit of the vine. And as I mentioned this, it's no surprise probably to most of us that this is the most controversial thing uh, in the Bible. And I don't want to talk about it in such in an argument's sake to, to act like who wins and who doesn't win. But just the simple truth that we find in the word of God on, on such a controversial thing that doesn't have to be. Now, now as... This liquid is mentioned in the Bible that is to be partaking for the representation of the blood of Jesus. There's only one terminology that is used for it as it connects to anything to do with the Lord's Supper. And that one word, that one phrase that is used is fruit of the vine. 
you will only find fruit of the vine in connection with the Lord's Supper. We don't find the word wine in connection when used with the Lord's Supper. It's, it's not in there. And I don't know why I'm saying this, but even if it were, the word wine in the original language is the same word for grape juice. I told someone that years ago and they said, well, that's just what Baptists say. And that right there told me that they weren't a student of the word because any Christian can take the Bible and tr take a Strong's Concordance. You can go deeper to a lexicon and you can simply look up the meanings of these words. And that's exactly what you're going to find. You're going to find that this one word, whether in the Old Testament in Hebrew, whether in the New Testament in Greek, it is going to mean the same thing. It's the same word for both. So you look at the context and what's going on in the situation in the Bible to determine which one they're talking about. But as I say that, the word wine is not used and attached to the Lord's Supper uh, throughout the word. We can all be a student of the word and study these things, though. But the fruit of the vine is the only terminology. And, and it's, it just makes it clear. But as far as, uh, I hope I don't muddy things up more, but clear things up more. I'm, I'm not going to. But we are going to look at some other thoughts. There are some other thoughts out there concerning uh, what represents the blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. We have some must-be-fermented thoughts that are out there in the world, as in it must the the grape juice must be fermented to get rid of the leaven that that's in the grape juice. You know, fermentation is a rotting. And I've never known of anything in a, in a rotten state that will purify anything else. You know, I, I walked into the grocery store a while back and right as soon as I walked in the front door, someone greeted me there and they offered me a sample of wine. And I usually say more than I should. Gets a little dramatic. This time I was going to be good about it. And I said, no, thank you. And next thing you know, I found myself roped into a conversation drawn into a conversation about it, I felt pressured. I felt pushed as if to shop, I needed to sample that wine. If you think my next thing is going to, I'm going to say is I did it. <laughs> I didn't. But, uh, but I, I'm sitting there and I felt pressured and I, I, I was so happy that I controlled my tongue and I just said, no, thank you. But, but I'm locked in and, they're, and I'm being drawn. And so I finally said, I like my grapefruit, my grape juice fresh, not rotten. OK, I didn't want to say it that way, but that's how I had to end it. That's what fermentation is. It's a rotting. So so there goes the thought of of it must be fermented as in as in to to purify the leaven out of the grape juice. Fermentation has nothing to do with with purification. So there goes that thought. But there's another it must be fermented thought. It's the only way to preserve grape juice is the stance that some take. Let me just say this in this day and time. You can Google how to preserve grape juice and you will find several ways to do it. And it doesn't necessitate fermentation to do so. Another thought on top of it must be fermented is, well, the members of Corinth prove that what was partaken in the Lord's Supper was strong drink, alcoholic wine. And those thoughts from come from first Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 21, where it speaks of one member is hungry and another member is drunken. I'm so glad 
that I had a Bible teacher when I first got saved that taught me to study words, to take words and go back to the original language. Because when I first read Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, I, I had no idea what in the world they were talking about. But you, but you look it up and it means don't worry. You take this word drunken and you look it up in the original language. That, that made, be careful for nothing made sense in 1611. So, some, were, some were hungry and some were drunken. That word drunken made sense in 1611. But what the word means is simply full. You look up that word drunken and it means full. It does not necessitate that there was strong drink involved. It does not necessitate intoxicating drink on, on someone's thoughts that there is proof that because of the church of Corinth, the Lord's Supper, uh, the, the partaking of, of the representation of the blood of Jesus was alcoholic wine. There's, there's nothing to stand on there. It doesn't prove that. You know, and there's a thought that, that let's just say, the, the word doesn't, doesn't necessitate that that's what it means. If they did do that, were they right? As I look through 1 Corinthians, I find a whole lot of things that God was using where they were in the wrong. So that wouldn't mean it's right, even if they did. But the word does, the word simply means full. They were full of something, and it didn't have to be intoxicating drink. No one has anything to stand on saying the members were drunk in relation to the event of the Lord's Supper at the church of Corinth. Well, we have some must be fermented thoughts. We have some members of Corinth prove it thoughts. And then there's a miraculously fermented thoughts. As we all know, it's a very popular one. I think I see some people shaking their heads already. Jesus turned the water into wine. You know, the professing Christians will talk to each other about that. No one brings that up with the preachers. For some reason, I never get in on that conversation, but I hear of so many who do. Again, what did we say about the word wine? It has the same meaning uh, for two different words. OK, you have wine and you have grape juice. Jesus turned the water into a fresh new drink. Now, I haven't heard anyone say what I'm about to say from my point of view. But check this out. Jesus turned that water into the, it, it, the, the brand new stage of that drink. The first stage of that drink. Man, there wasn't much better than a fresh, brand new glass or goblet or whatever of right? It was it was a miracle he did. He took water and he did that with it. Is it grape juice or is it wine? You know, fermentation is something of man that man does. For Jesus to turn that water into intoxicating drink, that means he would have had to have miraculously fermented it too. And the thing about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is he's the perfect, sinless Son of God. There is no error in our Lord. If there were any error in our Lord, our sins wouldn't be paid for. And we would have ahead of us to pay for our sins instead of the perfect son of God who did so. OK, there's no contradiction with Jesus to the word of God, Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus is the.
and he cannot contradict himself. And so in Habakkuk chapter two, verse 15, the word of the Lord says, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. That puttest thy bottle to him and makest him drunken also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. That's enough right there. The fact that our Lord and Savior does not contradict himself, does not go against the word in any way. I'm satisfied. That's enough proof right there of this allegation, this thought that someone has made. The element in the cup is called the fruit of the vine specifically for a very special reason because it's the grape juice. That's what we use. That's what we partake of the Lord's Supper with. And you know, I'd, I'd rather take this time again and say, I'd rather just not be up here dismissing thoughts of what's going on, but so many people get confused with this that it, there's an importance in focusing on the, the right ingredients as we partake of the Lord's Supper. A better focus, though, would be on the broken body, on the shed blood of our Lord, and remembering the sacrifice that He has made through His suffering that he might save you and I. But the other must be cleared up. And so that has been our attempt tonight. But that doesn't mean we can't close with that thought. With that thought of when we take the bread. And when we take the fruit of the vine. That we would, we would have our minds and our hearts so focused. On what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. As we take these ingredients that, that we scripturally discern and stand on the word of God on and take these ingredients and, and consider how it represents our Lord Jesus Christ and remembering what he did on that cross at Calvary when the, when the sky turned dark and the rocks rent and he took the sins of the world upon himself and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and they were wagging their heads at Jesus. And he said on that cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He willingly laid down his life and became broken in our place. No one killed the Lord Jesus, but he gave his life. He said he lays down his life for his friends. And that's what he did. For every single one of us willingly. He up again. And he satisfied God with that sacrifice. And he suffered for you and I. So, so as we get to this time. Where we partake in this precious event. Of the Lord's Supper. May we do exactly what Jesus told us to do. That we would do this. In remembrance of. Of him. It would never get old. Every day. To think about what Jesus Christ. Has done for us. It's a gift for eternity. Amen. Well it was good to be with you all here tonight. We will go into the next lesson. Next week in the partaking. Of the Lord's Supper. And pray you all get home safely. And have a great rest of your week. And that God would just help your hearts. Help your health. Help your hearts in whatever you're going through. He's such a good father. And I'm going to ask.